Michael Bolden is an ideologue who has spent years promoting the idea that states can nullify federal legislation they don't like. The very same argument pu pushed by defenders of slavery and segregation. And just as baseless now as it was then. That is from my hate watch profile over at the Southern Poverty Law Center, which you can find online. <laughs> Lou Rockwell told me years ago after Rachel Maddow, well, via email, Rachel Maddow did a 10-minute hit piece on my organization. It's a full 10-minute segment on how we are crazy, evil, secessors, racist, that uh, the pin may hurt, but it is a badge of honor. So that's how I look at the Southern Poverty Law Center. So today is an interesting, monumental, historic day. November the 10th. Everyone knows what that is, right? Oh, Diane. Diane might know this. 220 years ago today, on November 10th, 1798, the Kentucky State House passed resolutions passed by Tom, drafted by Thomas Jefferson in secret in response to the Alien and Sedition Acts and formalizing the principles of nullification, which was part of the fiber of the American Republic. Here's what Thomas Jefferson wrote. This is juicy stuff, too. The several states composing the United States of America are not united on a principle of unlimited submission to their general government. They didn't join together just to be a political subdivision, a county of Washington, D.C. And old T.J., smart guy, he said, whensoever, not after a court tells us, but whensoever the general government assumes undelegated powers, its acts are unauthoritative, void, and of no force. 220 years ago today. We don't hear about that in national holidays, do we? We got Labor Day. <laughs> May Day was a big one this year. Now, in Jefferson's original draft, some of the language was changed. Jefferson actually did not complain about it, but this made it, uh, much of this made it into the follow-up resolution passed in 1799. He said, we're, and this is, I apologize if it's a little long, I don't like just reading to people, but this is a historic day here, so I think it's important. Where powers are assumed which have not been delegated, a nullification of the act is the rightful remedy. Not a good idea. Not something you might want to consider in a few years after voting bums out or waiting for a Supreme Court. But as soon as it happens, this is the rightful remedy. And that every state has a natural right, not given to them by a piece of paper, but a natural right in cases not within the compact to nullify of their own authority, all assumption of power by others within their limits, and that without this right, they would be under the dominion, absolute and unlimited, of whosoever might exercise this right of judgment for them. 220 years ago today, I've always wanted to give a speech on nullification on nullification day. This might be, I don't know if you did this on purpose. <laughs> It has been my dream. I've been doing this for 12 and a half years. I have never, ever given a speech on nullification on November the 10th. So remember, remember the 10th of November. <laughs> Three days after the Kentucky House passed the resolution, the Senate followed suit. And on the 16th, the governor signed it. And the very next day, Thomas Jefferson, excited about his success, he sent a draft of the resolution to his good buddy, James Madison, in Virginia, with a letter. And this is what he had to say, a little part of it. I enclose you a copy of the draft of the Kentucky Resolves. I think we should distinctly affirm all the important principles they contain so as to hold to that ground in the future 
and leave the matter in such a train as that we may not be committed absolutely to push the matter to extremities and yet may be free to push as, a, as far as events will render prudent. Ooh, strategist. Now a return letter from James Madison back to Thomas Jefferson as recorded in Jefferson's journal, uh, I think it was uh, the 20th of December, was never found. So we don't know what Madison said in response. We do know that Virginia followed up passing similar resolutions in 1798. Now, in fact, Thomas Jefferson actually never gave us a strategic blueprint whensoever they do something outside their constitutional authority. A nullification is the rightful remedy. He didn't tell us how to nullify. He never gave us a step-by-step -step strategy on what to do. James Madison, on the other hand, actually did give us pretty interesting blueprint on what to do when the federal government does stuff that we don't want them to do. And mind you, he wasn't just Madison's blueprint, wasn't just about unconstitutional federal, federal acts. He called those unwarrantable. But he also called them warrantable if it's just bad policy. Now, just because something is constitutional doesn't mean that the Fed should do it. They don't have to. Like, it may be constitutional for them to declare war, which they haven't done in quite a long time, on some other country. But that doesn't mean we have to support it just because it's in the Constitution. That doesn't mean it's a good idea. So Madison actually gave us advice on how to deal with things that are either illegal, unjust, unconstitutional, or just stupid policy. And, uh, well, let's talk a little bit about Madison. Six weeks ish before the start of the Philadelphia Convention in 1787, just for those of you who like to geek out on this stuff, he sent a letter to his friend George Washington in Virginia with his ideas on the structure of the new government. And he was proposing something far more centralized in power than what was eventually approved by the, uh, the Philadelphia Convention and ratified by the people of the several states. And in one notable section, check this out, this is, he actually told Washington that he wanted the new national government to have a veto power over every act of the state governments, everything. He wanted the feds to be able to say, well, uh, we're going to have uh, some law on something. Well, the feds are going to come and say, well, you can't do that at any time. This is how he put it. A negative in all cases whatsoever on the legislative acts of the states as heretofore exercised by the kingly prerogative appears to me to be absolutely necessary and to be the least possible encroachment on the state jurisdictions. Absurd, right? <laughs> we might think of centralization of power as aggressive, which it is. Madison thought it was defensive. And he put it this way. This is the money quote. Without this defensive power, Every positive power that can be given on paper, they referred to the Constitution as a mere parchment barrier. Every positive power that can be given on paper will be evaded and defeated. So without a national veto, the states and the people can evade and defeat anything that the feds do. I didn't learn that in government school. I don't think any of us did. Now, the final version of this proposal ended up as resolution number six, when Edmund Randolph introduced the Virginia plan on May 29th, 1787. And uh, Randolph, Madison, and others called for the power to be in the federal government to use the full force of the Union against any state that got up at Ian did not apply, did not comply with the federal government. Now we know that the Virginia plan was rejected by the convention. A national veto power never made it into the Constitution. They came up with the moderate New Jersey type plan uh, called the Supremacy Clause. That is, that the federal power is supreme only when done in pursuance of the delegated powers of the Constitution. This is all going to make sense, I promise you. <laughs> now, less than a year later, Madison is singing a different tune-ish. The structure was the same, but his political position had changed when he wrote Federalist Paper Number 46. And I'm not one of these people that just, oh, they said it in the Federalist, so that's what everything is. I mean, this Federalist Papers, I don't know if anybody mentioned it earlier, they were written for a New York audience to sell ratification of the Constitution where Clinton and other, not Bill, but <laughs> Clinton and others were probably going to defeat it. 
So Madison, Hamilton, John Jay, they were trying to sell ratification of the Constitution in New York. And in Federalist 46, Madison was responding to complaints from anti-federalists, which was a term of art and propaganda. He was responding to anti-federalists who were saying, oh, this new central government's going to have all kinds of power. It's going to run roughshod over the states. Well, Madison knew just what he told George Washington, which people of the time didn't realize, that every power on paper can be evaded and defeated without a national veto power, which they did not approve. So he actually came up with a blueprint to sell ratification of the Constitution. He gave us four steps on what to do. And let me just go through them really quickly. One, the disquiet, and I'll use his language, the disquietude of the people. Madison said that the people would have to protest. They'd have to go nuts when the federal government does stuff that they're not supposed to do. Bad policy, bad uh, approaches to the Constitution. The people should be protesting. Think of how the fiber of the existence of the American Republic, the mentality that came out of the Stamp Act resistance. I know that was not Madison's action, but think of the protests to the Stamp Act. There was some disquietude of the people that helped defeat that horrible plan. Two, their repugnance and perhaps a refusal to cooperate with officers of the Union. You have to be careful when you look at writings from the founding days, and you always have to use a dictionary of the time. I think of repugnance, I think of things like horrible foreign policy, debasing the currency, gun control, mass surveillance, the Federal Reserve, uh, basically every politician who's been in Washington, D.C. in my lifetime. They are repugnant to my ideals as a human being. But that's not how it was defined at the time. If you were to look at a lay dictionary like Samuel Johnson's Dictionary of the English Language, probably 1772, I think you can get a free copy online. Google Books, not that I like Google. Uh, but the way they defined it was disobedient, not obsequious, which is compliant. So Madison was saying, if you want to defeat the federal government, you have to disobey them. As long as you continue to comply, there's no reason for them to change. He also recommended a refusal to cooperate with officers of the Union. His words, not mine. Three, the frowns of the executive magistracy, that's such a hard word for me, of the state. Governors, we're supposed to play an important role. We have a lot of really crappy governors around the country. <laughs> you should try my state. <laughs> it is pretty bad. And I think our next speaker, Dan Fisher, is going to give us some more insight on things that governors could do. Madison was talking about generating awareness, using the bully pulpit of the governor's office to rally people to the cause. And then four, legislative devices, which would be added on such occasions. He was open-ended on what these legislative devices were, but we know how he and his friend Thomas Jefferson used legislative devices to oppose the Alien and Sedition Acts just over a decade later. Legislative devices. Now the interesting part is using these steps, four steps, not one of them included voting the bums out, not one of them included protesting federal politicians in the hopes that federal politicians would stop using federal power. Not one of them included suing in federal court in the hope that the federal courts would limit federal power. Not one of them included any of these strategies that we've all been taught to use as our first response. But he said using these other strategies that no one seems to learn about, well, until now, would, quote, present obstructions which the federal government would hardly be willing to encounter. In other words, any power on paper can be evaded and defeated by the people and the states by simply using this four-step blueprint by James Madison. And I think he's smarter on the Constitution than me, so I'm just reporting on what he had to say. Now, did Madison politically flip-flop? I mean, clearly he was opposed to this. He thought this was bad and they had to stop this in his letter to Washington. And just seven, eight months later, he's actually using it to sell it. Oh, wow, guess what? There's this great thing. You can stop the feds whenever you want to. Just follow these steps. I don't know. I don't know if he flip-flopped. I don't know if the letters that he had back and forth with Thomas Jefferson convinced him otherwise. I don't know if Washington actually told him. There are much smarter scholars. I am no scholar. I'm an activist. 
there are scholars here who could probably help me find the answer to that. I don't know if he was just a politician. My guess is he was just being political. He wanted to have this national veto power. He lost that battle, but he really felt that the Constitution needed to be ratified, so he changed his tune for the public to say this is now a positive thing because he wanted. We know letters later on during the Virginia Ratifying Convention, for example, if you read Pauline Mayer's works, uh, who wrote really interesting popular history that is really kind of fun to read. Uh, but Madison would speak privately about how I tried to do this. I tried to convince that Patrick Henry, but he just doesn't listen. So he tried to do a lot of things. He didn't get it, but then he decided, well, I'm going to still sell it. So I don't know the answer. But it doesn't matter because either way, feature or flaw, states are not required to help the federal government violate your liberty. And when enough people say no to Washington, D.C., and enough states use legislative devices to back them up, there is not much that the federal government can do to force their so-called laws, regulations, mandates, orders, or whatever down our throats. Now keep in mind, Madison recommended this strategy when the federal government was tiny. I know the Constitution was much more centralized than the Articles, but compared to today, I mean, Washington, D.C. literally tells us how big our toilet can be. Can you imagine President Washington telling Thomas Jefferson, you know, Monticello, your toilets, your outhouses are way too big. <laughs> it's a joke. They tell us what kind of light bulbs we can have or purchase. Oh, Samuel Adams, you, got, uh, you can only have soy candles. <laughs> they tell us what kind of plants we can grow in our backyard. Washington and Jefferson grew hemp. And they even tell us that the words shall not be infringed actually don't mean shall not be infringed. So at a time when it was tiny, just evading and defeating the federal government was taking a hands-off approach. Don't participate th with them. Don't help them. Disobey them. Protest them. And you can defeat them. When you do this in enough states, they are through. And I'm going to give you some examples that you'll find fun. Well, maybe it'll piss you off a little bit. But So back during the so-called government shutdown of 2013, you guys remember that? That fake shutdown? I mean, we can all dream that someday we might have a real one. <laughs> that would be the best thing that could happen to the world. But during that so-called fake shutdown uh, in 2013, the National Governors Association was incredibly alarmed. And they put out a press release talking about how all kinds of federal programs were going to come to an end. Not because the feds were stopping primarily, but they said they had this nice little tidbit in there. They said, states are partners with the federal government on, quote, most federal programs. When the federal government does something, some kind of unconstitutional garbage, which we could qualify as basically everything they've done in modern times, they're not the ones doing the enforcement. Almost never. They want you to think they are, but they really aren't. The ATF has approximately 5,300 agents for the employees for the entire country, and only one third of them, or one third of them, are in. Um, they're paper pushers. Uh, they're in administration. So they have like oh, math. I went to government school, so I'm kind of dumb. Um, what is that, like 3,700, 3,500 actual enforcement agents? They have a capacity of actually uh, closing about 8,000 firearms cases per year. So if you think about it this way, if there are 10 or 11 million undocumented short-barreled shotguns in violation of the National Firearms Act of 1934, the feds without the assistance of the states, and in fact, with the assistance of the states, would never, ever be able to stop the people. So the short version here, the exciting version, is that partnerships don't work too well when half the team quits. So no matter what Washington, D.C. wants to do, if they don't get the help to carry out the programs that they are forcing down our, they want to, they want to force down our throats, they're never going to be implemented. So moving forward, a quick story, eh, quick-ish, I tend to ramble, that I think only two people here have heard. <laughs> New Orleans. So two people have heard. But it's an example of how this strategy is being put into practice right now. And my hope 
is that you can hear this, and whether you like what they're doing it for or not, you can say, wow, you know what? This works. And instead of begging, and I, I know no one here is begging for permission from Washington, D.C. I'm amongst friendly people. But instead of actually using the strategy where we wait on federal politicians to limit their own power, which will never, ever, ever, ever happen, ever, there's something else that can be done and is happening right now. So back in 1996, voters in my home country of California, they passed what was known as Proposition 215. Everyone knows what that is? No, no one, no one, no one, no one. This is called the Compassionate Use Act, which legalized marijuana for limited medical purposes. Now, in the run-up to that vote, there was a lot of a uh, reefer madness type of stuff, basically. We were told, now, mind you, I just moved to California in 95 from the great socialist center of Milwaukee, Wisconsin. We had a socialist mayor, for real. Henry Mayer was, Henry Mayer was the mayor, and uh, he had an S next to his name. I think he was the last living one in the country, um, at least admitting it. So in the run-up to the vote, we heard a lot of things like, oh, wow, if you do this, um, you know, the terrorists are going to win. Um, you know, your babies are going to die. The cartels, who somehow like legal markets rather than black markets, uh, they're going to be more powerful and more rich. Well, three presidents actually came to California to lobby against it. One current, one, and two pre one current at the time, and two previous. And their message was a little bit of that, but they focused primarily on what my thought was at the time was like, what are these people doing? They can't. They're going to do what? They can't do this. And that's what we were told. You can't do this. You know that thing called the Supremacy Clause? Well, it says you can't. We already have a law in Washington, D.C. called the Controlled Substances Act, passed in 1970, and in compliance with the United Nations Treaty, mind you. So international laws requiring the U.S. to ban a plant. Um, and you can't do this. Supremacy Clause says you're going to lose. You can't do it. Even if you try to, we're going to shut it down. And if we don't shut it down, we're going to sue you and it's going to the federal court and you're going to spend a lot of money and you're going to lose. So don't waste your time. It's stupid. It's okay. We understand. Just vote in some new representatives and change the law, just like Jeff Sessions told us last year. Good riddance to that piece of garbage. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I can't help it. I have got a real issue with that guy. <laughs> It's because I like liberty, and he does not. <laughs> so we know that that marketing campaign from three different presidents, that's pretty impressive. Three presidents marching into California to tell us what we can and cannot do. Well, the people of California voted to pass the Compassionate Use Act anyway. And after it passed, within days, the Clinton administration, that's the Bill Clinton administration, in case anyone was wondering, <laughs> I think, they wanted to make sure that everyone knew that federal law was supreme. And here's what Janet Reno had to say. Oh, now that's someone I find repugnant. <laughs> Janet said, quote, we want to make clear that federal law still applies. And the feds immediately started prepping for what do you expect? A bunch of raids and aggressive actions against the state of California. And in early 97, January, the Los Angeles Times, who would have guessed they would be a propaganda mouthpiece for the central government? I never would have thought so. But they put out an editorial that said, quote, federal officials vowed to pursue California physicians who recommend marijuana for their patients. The federal government, we were told, were going to shut things down. They were going to take licenses from doctors. They started doing raids. They did dozens of them. Very aggressive. Bill Clinton hated the 10th Amendment, clearly. I mean, yeah, why do I even have to say that? But at the end of his term, those threats didn't really do much because the people of California did not relent. And by the time he left office, there were seven states that were defying his view. And him and Janet wanted us to believe that we couldn't do this. Supremacy Clause said we couldn't do this, but we did anyways. Now, from there, our great buddy George W. Bush comes in. Big fans of him here, right? <laughs> you can boo. <laughs> he ramped it up. He was even more aggressive than Bill Clinton. Surprise. Took a real hardline public stance saying that federal law was supreme. I mean, they had the backwards version. These people are actually taking the position that the Virginia plan passed and that the federal government has a national veto over whatever the people of the states decide. But they've got it wrong. 
And we're proving it, too. Maybe people don't even realize they're proving it, but they are proving it. The Bush administration conducted about 200 raids. The Clinton administration did 50 in uh, four years. Bush administration did about 200 over eight years. And he even, he, the administration even got the Supreme Court on their side in a famous case known as Gonzalez versus Rach. Does anyone know Gonzalez versus Rach? Okay, the glasses, of course. <laughs> I love you guys. Mark knows it too. That's so cool. So let me tell you a quick story about someone I think is a hero. When you think of heroes in California, any names come to mind? People talk about like Arnold Schwarzenegger, right? <laughs> so there are some people think of heroes in California. A lot of people in California think Cesar Chavez. I kind of think of Angel Rach, the subject of this story. If we're thinking about this as if I'm telling you in the late 90s, early 2000s, Angel Rach has a giant cancer tumor in her brain. Angel will die from this. She is a goner. Her doctor recommended that she try using cannabis to treat it. Now, at the time, there wasn't much scientific study behind this. There has been a lot more since. And they primarily were dealing with the issue of someone going through cancer treatment, losing the ability to send signals of hunger from your stomach to your brain, and therefore you get emaciated, you uh, are malnourished, and you die. So the old idea in the movies that when you have some weed, you get munchies, think about that. A lady like Angel, she's getting munchies and ordering a pizza at 2 in the morning. That will save her life. So her doctor recommended this to help with her appetite primarily, also with mood and pain. And she was so ill that she couldn't even handle growing the plants. There weren't really dispensaries. In Southern California, there were. Uh, sorry, Fresno. You were a little late to the game. But <laughs> so she had her friend, Diane Monson, who was also a cancer patient, was acting as her caregiver. So Diane grew six plants for the two of them in Diane's backyard. What does an unconstitutional federal agency do with that? I'm referring to the DEA, which like the ATF, the TSA, and just about everything else in Washington, DC shouldn't even exist. What do they do? They pick out the sickest, weakest person, and they use them as an example to scare other people into submission. So they called up their buddies in the Butte County Sheriff's Department. I'm not talking Butte, Montana, Butte, Northern California. And they raided Diane's home for six plants. I mean, think about this. Angel's dying from a tumor in her brain. Her doctor says, you need this. She's sitting there looking at, at the DEA and the sheriff's department, sitting there saying, I'm dying. I need this. I have cancer in my skull. Please don't do this. And they are stomping out her plant, saying the supremacy clause trumps your cancer. It is repugnant to my views as a human being. So what did they do? Angel and Diane decided to sue they sued in federal court. Now, in hindsight, I'm an expert in hindsight. They should have, should have sued. <laughs> they should have sued the county or the sheriff's department of the state for helping the feds violate her rights. But they sued the federal government. They were represented by, I believe, Randy Barnett of Georgetown Law, who at one point when he liked me, uh, he told me that if you argue the Tenth Amendment in federal court, they will laugh you out of there. Eh, maybe not as much anymore, but at the time. So they sued in federal court where her doctor testified under oath. If she doesn't get to continue using this plant, she, her life is at stake. That's how he put it. Her life is at stake. Under oath, a doctor who I would trust on doctor stuff more than me or any black robe deity that sits on a Supreme Court. Well, how did the court respond? Well, under the heroic leadership of conservative icon Justice Scalia, the Supreme Court held that growing six plants in your backyard, never taking them across state lines, never buying or selling them, and consuming them in your home counted as interstate commerce. Yeah, repugnant. I'm going to keep hitting that one. Interstate commerce that the federal government could control, regulate, or totally prohibit at their will. And now for many people who have told me, well, Scalia was solid, maybe he was political on that one, you know, we've got to give him a pass. You know what the Obama administration did when the Obamacare case came up in NFIB versus Sibelius? 
They use Scalia's arguments against weed to back, it was their primary argument to back up Obamacare and non-economic activity. So you, this is a message, side message. You can't turn a blind eye to limitations of the federal government on the Constitution because if you do, eventually the feds will treat those things as if there are no limits at all and use them against you. So Angel, in the run-up to this decision, she was telling people that she was going to move to Canada if she lost. And we all know that liberals like talking about moving to Canada, right? Oh, we heard Johnny Depp back in the day. If Bush won re-election, he was moving to Paris. I guarantee you he owned a condo the entire time less than one mile from my apartment. Everybody knew he was there. But Angel, this was serious. She was worried about her life. This is even more threatening to her life than dodging the draft and going there during Vietnam, where you might die. But she knew she was, her doctor was telling her, you're a goner if you don't treat yourself. Somewhere along the line, she had a change of heart. And after the Supreme Court issued their opinion, mind you, I did not say ruling, they do not rule. After they issued their opinion, and I'm not sure if this happened in San Francisco or on the steps of the courthouse. NBC has not released any footage of it to me yet. Maybe they will. Uh, but she issued a public statement saying that even though the Supreme Court had their opinion, she was going to continue doing what she was doing, no matter what they had to say, and she was going to help others defy the Supreme Court as well. <laughs> Someday I'm going to live on Rach Road. Now think about this. The Bush administration went crazy with raids, 200 of them. They had the Supreme Court on their side. You'd think, oh man, they are shutting things down. At the end of Obama's term, there was seven. By the time Bush left office, there were 13 states that were defying Washington, D.C. on a plant. Now from there, we all know that Obama was a pothead, right? <laughs> he was weak on crime. He would not enforce the law. And he was, you know, he was hands off on this whole pot issue, right? Did anybody hear that message? I hear it all the time. It is propaganda bull. Now, establishment Republicans and establishment Democrats both benefit from this message. On the right, not the real right, but just that Washington, D.C. garbage, they love talking about this because they say, well, Obama was a pothead, so you can't trust him. Obama was a lawbreaker. You can't trust him. Obama was weak on crime. You can't trust him. This is a big rallying cry for Republicans. And on the left, the Democrats love this because, well, I mean, the peace president who dropped more bombs around the world, 100,000 to Bush's 70,000, which is the absurdity, they still wanted to sell this message. Those are real facts that we got from the Air Force. Um, they wanted to sell the message that Obama was caring and loving and peaceful, that piece of junk. So this is just propaganda. Obama, now remember the numbers that I told you, 50 raids under the Clinton administration, 200 under the Bush administration, in just Obama's first four years, one term, he spent more money on enforcement and conducted more raids, 270, than George Bush and Bill Clinton combined in three terms in 12 years. He was the absolute worst in history. Has anyone here been to Colorado? Any Colorado people? We have one Colorado person I saw, okay. So Amendment 64, which is the recreational weed thing that was passed in 2012 and went into effect January 1st, 2014, five weeks before that went into effect, the Obama administration, right around Thanksgiving time, what a nice guy, he and his buddies in uh, federal and local law enforcement conducted the largest series of raids on marijuana businesses in Colorado state history. This was a warning shot, I was told. The feds can come in and shut these people down whenever they want. But yet six weeks later, there are tens of thousands of people in the streets lining up to make purchases at illegal business, illegal to the feds, but ignoring them, refusing to obey federal law, refusing to cooperate with officers of the union, as James Madison advised. And today, the industry there is about $1.2 billion a year. Now, even with Obama's heavy ramp up, at the end of his term, well, it, Clinton was seven states. At the end of Bush, there was 13, roughly doubling. And again, roughly doubling at the end of Obama's term, there were 29 states that had legalized this plan, even though the Fed said they couldn't. 
Now, I know we're not using Obama math, so after the next one, it's not going to be 57. But, <laughs> but in general, they keep ramping this up no matter how much the feds continue to try their enforcement. So 29 states. Last year, West Virginia became state number 30. Earlier this year, Utah became state number 31. This summer, Oklahoma passed the broadest medical marijuana law in history, makes California's look restrictive, to become 32. And on Tuesday, Missouri became state number 33. The Silber family, thank you guys. Now, even Colorado's massive industry is tiny compared to California. You should visit my country someday. We have good food. <laughs> now, as a medical product alone, this is before the whole retail thing went into effect. It was the number one cash crop in the state. $2.8 billion a year. This is more than grapes, almonds, and milk combined. Huge. And they expect the recreational industry to get to about $5 billion a year by 2020 or so. In my city of Los Angeles, there are about 700 licensed marijuana businesses, all defying Washington, D.C., in operation today. Well, at least as I checked uh, around, uh, around the summertime. And there are hundreds more that operate without permission from the state, nullifying the state as well. Uh, the estimates are, no one really knows, the estimates that I saw at its peak was probably about 1,700. Now, this is more than Starbucks and 7-Eleven combined. You go to New York City, there's always the joke, there's a Starbucks on this corner, there's a Starbucks on this corner, there's a 7-Eleven uh, on this corner. You go to some areas in where I live and you're gonna have a weed doctor, weed store, weed doctor, weed store. I mean, they are everywhere. They are all over the place and there is nothing that can be done to stop them at this point. We actually ran the numbers. We know how much it costs the DEA to do a raid in partnership with the states, which is always in partnership. And it would take about 40% of the DEA's annual budget for the whole year to raid and investigate the city of Los Angeles alone. That does not include the full cost of prosecution at all. So if they wanted to shut down just LA, it would cost 40% of their annual budget. And that doesn't count Detroit, Michigan, Boston, Oklahoma City. Jefferson City, Denver, Seattle, Anchorage, Alaska, Seattle, San Francisco. They're, this is done. They have no way to stop this. Here's how I put it in a video back in 2015. Even in the face of increasing federal enforcement measures, the states have found the winning path. It's only a matter of time before they overwhelm federal enforcement capabilities completely and the feds will have to act like they've decided to drop the issue just to save face. That's exactly what we are on the verge of seeing happen today. They are dropping the issue because they can't do anything about it because enough people are disobeying the federal government and enough states are using legislative devices to help defy them. And it's important to note that none of this is happening because of the kindness of Washington, D.C. or because of the constitutional views of some Supreme Court justice. They are happening in spite of them. 33 states, that's huge, are nullifying the federal government on pot. 18 of them are defined using a similar process on industrial hemp. I have hemp seeds on my granola. I use hemp oil. I, if you follow me on Facebook, you see I post pictures of little baby parrots, my pets. One of the most uh, important um, parts of their diet is omega-3s, and they seem to process hemp oil better than anything else. So I feed them hemp oil. Hemp, according to the federal government, has been illegal. It doesn't have any THC in it. It's been illegal in the U.S. And the U.S. then, to grow, you can purchase food products and soaps and all kinds of things, but you can't grow it here. So the U.S. is the world's number one importer of raw industrial hemp. What's the number one exporter? Well, China. So the next time you hear about a trade imbalance with China, why don't you start talking about my suggestion? The federal government should stop banning farmers from growing products here at home. CBD oil is available in all 50 states, even though just earlier this year, I get CBD infused coffee. It's non-psychoactive. It helps with inflammation. I run, I'm getting older. I can't see as well anymore, uh, but it helps my knees feel better. I get CBD infused coffee right down the street. That's illegal, according to Washington, D.C. Rusty Payne, what a great name. DEA spokesman said earlier this year in Indiana, it's illegal. 
It is just not legal. That is his direct quote. But no, it's not just weed. I'm giving you the California version here. 40 states have passed what's called a Right to Try Act, which nullifies, partially, FDA restrictions on dying people. The only way I can explain this is, someone, imagine you've got three months to live. Your doctor says to you, you are, you're done. But you know what? We've, there's been some trials in some other countries, some positive results on an experimental treatment. And if you take this treatment, it might kill you faster than three months. But we know that, I don't know, 40% of people live another five years. You want to do it? It's a free will, right? You have your choice. You're on your deathbed. Why not make that decision for yourself? The FDA has told people to die because their process is like another 10 years to get it approved. Well, 40 states have passed these laws that defy the FDA on dying people. Here in Texas, the heroic Dr. Ibrahim Deplasand, a Houston-based oncologist, thank you, Dr. Deplasand, he was doing a trial under the FDA to treat people for the form of cancer that took the life of Steve Jobs. In 2015, around March, he applied for an extension to get approval from Washington, D.C. to continue it because 86 people were still alive with his treatment. The FDA told him to immediately stop, even though he told them he thought they would all die. The FDA is willing to kill people, these monsters. Thankfully, the Texas right to try law went into effect sometime that next month. I think, well, it was passed, I think, in April and went into effect shortly after. So Dr. Deplasan continued treating people under the state law, defying and nullifying the federal law. And the last I checked, not everybody was still alive, but it was about a year and a half after that that many of them were still living. Dozens of people were still alive because of a hero named Dr. Ibrahim Deplasan and the nullification legislative device called the Texas Right to Try Act. Now, Congress, sometime this year, passed a federal right to try law. President Trump signed it into effect. Very good things. They aren't as good as the state level ones in most situations. But this only happened after 38 states had already taken action. It starts at the bottom and it grows. And sometimes you can change federal policy by ignoring it and defying it and advancing what you want on a state or a local level first. And that's really how it works. That's what James Madison recommended. Seven states, Colorado, Arizona, California, New Mexico, Nebraska, Maryland, and Ohio have opted out of a vast majority of a federal asset forfeiture sharing program called Equitable sharing. If you want to know what that is in more detail, we can talk after. Four states have, it's stealing, robbery, government approved stealing. But seven states are opting out of a program that the federal government pushes on the states and nullifying it in practice and effect. Four states, Tennessee, Kansas, Idaho, and Mississippi have taken very small but positive steps to set the foundation to nullify federal gun control. They've got a lot more work to do there, Kansas especially. And on Tuesday, eight counties in Oregon passed ballot measures, some by huge margins. One was 73 to whatever. Again, my government math. That would set the stage to create gun rights sanctuary counties. Eight of them. Eight out of ten passed, basically saying that we're creating a mechanism to ban the use of material support, manpower, or resources to the enforcement of any federal gun law or state. I mean, they're going real hardcore there. Arizona, Wyoming, and Utah have all taken the lead on supporting money, not fiat paper garbage, by making gold and silver what it should be under the Constitution, which is legal tender. Here in Texas, the bullion depository, which opened up just this year, has the potential. I'm not sure if it will work out this way because government is involved, but has the potential to facilitate sound money transactions for everyday people at everyday uh, stores, wherever they want, gold and silver. You would put money into your account. This is actually already happening at a company called UPMA, United Precious Metals Association, upma.org in Utah. They are in business right now. You deposit gold and silver into your account. Your money actually holds its value rather than the devalued garbage that is uh, the fiat notes from the Federal Reserve. You have an account. You get a debit card with a Visa or a MasterCard symbol on it. You go to the local store. You buy some groceries. You swipe your card. In the back end, it converts the gold to fiat. The merchant gets the garbage fiat, and you get to buy something at a higher purchasing value. That's something that holds its value. They are talking, 
that's supposed to happen here in Texas with multiple branches, basically a gold and silver bank that's outside the, uh, the Federal Reserve System. This is potentially very, very huge here in Texas. And for those of you who hate the NSA as much as I do, the state of Michigan this summer, a law went into effect that bans the use of, quote, material support or resources to help effectuate any warrantless mass surveillance programs. Material support or resources is language I personally lifted from the Patriot Act that is used against humans, and we turned it around and put it against the federal government. Here in Texas, and I, maybe the glasses can tell me, there was a great state legislator, he may still be in, who introduced a bill a few years ago. Uh, John Athan Stickland, thank you, introduced a bill that would do the same here in Texas. They laughed at him. You got to keep trying, though. You know why? Because back in 2006, the NSA maxed out the Baltimore area power grid. They were collecting so much information, even back in 2006, that they were shutting down the electrical grid for the whole Baltimore area. Fort Meade was going nuts. So what did they do? They started searching for new locations around the country. We know they famously built the Bluffdale, Utah facility, which requires millions of gallons of water to operate to keep their supercomputers cooled. And if the state of Utah or the political subdivision that is Bluffdale simply just turned off that water, the NSA facility would be shut down. So here in Texas, down in San Antonio, the NSA also recognized, well, electricity is a big, big deal. So they're leeching off of your independent power grid like the monsters that they are. You have an independent power grid that isn't going to come down if the federal system goes down or other states. So they, in an old Sony factory down in San Antonio, they built bigger than the Utah facility, a massive data collection facility. Mind you, it's about two miles away from a new Microsoft data center. Surprise, surprise. So it's easy for them to collect that information directly. But the legislation that Representative Stickland, is he still in office? Yeah. Oh, okay, nice, nice. This man is badass. You should definitely support him for doing this. His legislation would have turned off the electricity to the NSA facility until they started following the Fourth Amendment, which we know will be never. The short version of what I'm talking about here, here's how our great friend Thomas Jefferson put it back in 1774. Quote, a free people claim their rights as derived from the laws of nature and not as a gift of their chief magistrate. Our long-run victory is liberty. It's not going to happen overnight, and it's going to be a lot of work. I want the government people to get the hell out of my life and yours, and the way we're going to make that happen is if we work together to nullify these people into oblivion. Thank you so much for your time.